All right, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about work protection outside the U.S. And we'll begin with Japan. Um, other developed uh, countries in the developed world, workers also benefit from sometimes similar or possibly even greater uh, welfare guarantees than in the U.S. Um, in Japan, it's pretty much understood that you will enjoy lifetime employment um, in your firm. And because firms are willing to commit so much to Japanese employees, the Japanese employees are also extremely committed to their, uh, their firm and they are known to work themselves uh, to death. Um, because of the intense loyalty of employees to the firm and vice versa, um, unions in Japan never really took off. There wasn't a lot of agitation for um, employee rights. Worker protection in Europe is something I have a little bit of experience with and we'll talk about that. Um, the social welfare model in Europe um, was designed kind of with an understanding of the backdrop of all the bad things that happened during the 30s um, with widespread unemployment and hunger and then also uh, World War II pretty much destroyed Europe so the social welfare system kind of came in um, with the intention of protecting people from similar things like that if they were to happen again. Um, there are advantages and um, disadvantages of uh, the social welfare model um, in Europe. Uh, the first part is uh, workers in Europe are very expensive because you have to pay all their social welfare costs. There's a, there's a heavy tax rate um, associated um, with workers. So I'll give an example from France because that's where I, I live for four years. Um, in France, you know, it's very, very uh, low cost healthcare, almost free. Now, because of that, there's a high taxation rate when you employ uh, laborers. Um, so you have to pay them uh, quite a bit more. And these laborers actually become so expensive that uh, frequently firms will take their business elsewhere. Um, let me give a couple of stories in, in, in a slide or so when I talk about trade-offs of labor regulation. Um, however, what I would add in Europe and, uh, and other places, um, generally speaking, according to international labor conventions, certain things are no longer allowed. Uh, forced or compulsory labor uh, no longer exists. Let me give an example of that his from history. Um, in Europe, for example, and again I'll use an example from France, there was something called uh, la corvée. And corvée was m when all peasants had to work on roads for a minimum mandatory two weeks of every year. Um, so they weren't really paid. It was something that everybody had to do was like a, a service. And, and corvée is actually one of the most hated words in the French language. Of course, child labor is no longer allowed. Um, employment discrimination, which we're going to talk about in our next lecture. Um, prison labor is also not allowed. And of course, unions are guaranteed the right to uh, collective bargaining. So the pros of uh, worker protection are job security, especially if you're a laborer. Um, I think about when I was in France, you have two kinds of employment contracts. You have CDD, um, contract of a de definite duration, so uh, like, you know, hey, I'm going to hire you for one, three, whatever the, the number of years is. And then CDI, um, contract of indefinite duration, meaning lifetime employment. And that's a great thing. Um, if you can count on the fact that you have a lifetime employment, uh, you don't have to worry about job security, you can plan for your future, you can look at things like buying a house, starting a family. Um, you can feel free to speak your mind at work because you don't have to worry about being fired because of your uh, opinions. That's a good thing. The right of collective bargaining. Again, even though you may have a lifetime contract, you may have some issues with wages or workplace bullying and some of these things, and you can file a grievance with your labor union, and the labor union can band together and uh, stand up for you. Of course, high wages. Um, wages continue to, to rise under worker protection goals. Think about minimum wage. Uh, minimum wage guarantees people at least some quality of life, maybe not a livable wage as they've described, uh, discussed in current debates, but at least you get something. Uh, limited hours. You have to remember, back in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, people were working uh, 12 plus hours a day, every single day. Um, so people were working, at least in theory, fewer hours, which is, which is good for people. Pensions. I mean, what a great idea to be able to one day retire and not live destitute or not have to depend on your family, but to actually have some degree of income. Health and safety. Again, if you get sick uh, in the workplace or you're injured at work, um, you can get a worker's compensation. 
Also, the fact that, you know, things like universal health care like they have in Europe, that's also a positive. And, of course, non-discrimination. Uh, you cannot be fired uh, simply because of belonging to uh, one or more protected groups. We'll talk about that in class. So, worker protection is great, but it means you're less flexible with what you can do with your employees. Okay? You can't necessarily fire them. You have to pay all these extra costs. It decreases competitiveness and um, means your operations are less flexible than they would be. Then you also have competitiveness goals. Okay? So if you don't have worker protection, you're not, you don't hesitate to create jobs because you know you can always eliminate people if you need to. So you can hire somebody for one, two, or three months and you just fire them when, when uh, you can no longer afford to pay them or the mission is done. Um, it allows for a, a great degree of restructuring. If a new form of technology comes along, you can buy that technology and lay off workers. Um, allows you, again, adopting new technology. You're not worried about uh, how the labor market will react because it's not relevant. Um, if demand changes, again, you can hire more workers, you can lay off workers. It gives you total flexibility, almost giving you a pulse onto the marketplace. Encouraging investment. You can invest in me because I, can, I have a pulse on the, uh, on the market, on the supply and demand. Again, allowing turnover, that's huge. And of course, reducing the regulatory burden. So you pay fewer taxes in theory because there's fewer regulators to supervise what you're doing. Okay? So, you know, I'll give some examples uh, of kind of good and bad things. I mean, you think about employ employment at will. Okay? Imagine that you're a worker and you've moved across the country and then all of a sudden you're fired. Oh my goodness, I mean, you've uprooted, you've left your old life behind. Um, to start some new job, you anticipate that you'd stay there five years, and you're fired after six months. Maybe you're fired because you didn't do a good job, or maybe you're fired because of, uh, they didn't like you, they eliminate the position, whatever. All of a sudden now, you're in a mess. Okay, So um, labor regulation is good for the firm, because if they don't like you or can no longer afford to pay you, they can just get rid of you. But it can be very hard for the worker themselves. Now the flip side would be when you have, again, I'll use my, my pick on where I used to live in France, uh, great worker protection. I mean, some of the places I worked in France, you had people that um, really didn't care. They, didn't, they weren't motivated to work at all because they knew they had a lifetime contract. Or maybe they didn't get along with their boss, so they just decide that they would show up to work but no longer work. And, of course, you can't fire them, really, for any reason. Um, so you had things like that. I had a colleague, um, he was 59 years old, he only needed to work three more years for retirement. Uh, he would drink at work, he'd cuss his boss up and down one way and the other and say, well, you can go ahead and fire me, that's fine, you'll pay my unemployment for three years, and then I'm going to be retired. I don't care anymore. That was kind of his attitude. Cool guy as a friend, but probably a disaster to have as an employee. Um, one of the other companies where I was working bought a rival firm, and this rival firm they had a, they had, it was an organization that had a very heavy number of administrators and all sorts of people that our company deemed were no longer qualified uh, to work there. However, they all had lifetime contracts when that before that company was bought by our company, so we couldn't fire any of them. It will take 30 years for all those people to have lived out their contracts and retired before they, we can actually put new workers in to these organizations. That's also bad. Um, I also remember when I was in France, um, in order to... France has a very high unemployment rate for people under 34. And um, so what they tried to do was, well, let's encourage employers to take a risk on young people and give them uh, employment at will. Sounds great. You can hire a young person. You don't have to worry about paying their wages for you know the next uh, 32 years. Uh, you can just hire them for two or three months, six months, a year, if it works out, whatever. You would think young people would have been thrilled to have had the opportunity to work. That's not what happened. Um, all the students and all the young people went on strike. They occupied the universities. It was a complete disaster. They didn't want the flexibility. They wanted the lifetime contract. So, um, again, it's great if you've actually got a job. It's bad for the employers because you can't fire non-performing employees. You're very hesitant to hire people because you don't know how they're going to turn out and that also contributes to high unemployment. Uh, and again, you know, hopefully you can strike some sort of a middle ground, uh, but neither system is perfect. All right, great. 
So, I hope you found this lecture informative and entertaining. And again, my name is Duncan Pelly, and I will see you next time.